Our talk today is uh, going to be by Chinmay Patel on Intro to NFTs. What is, an N what is a non-fungible token? How is it created? And what to use it for? Also, other use cases. Chinmay has been in that blockchain space for about four years and is currently involved in building a number of NFT solutions. So I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. When you say it, like, it sounds so cool. Like, I, I was not expecting you to say it that way. So, but thank you very much for the intro. <laughs> uh, 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 by the way, and thanks, Warren, for bringing me here as well. You mentioned about this. Uh, we talked about the NFT presentation from a different place. So I'm, I'm mostly going to repeat, and you were part of the last presentation. So feel free to jump in. This is, I, I'm planning to keep this very, very uh, open conversation. Look, the NFT space has been out there for no more than two years and hot space for no more than four to six months. So no one has really a major head start. So I've been working on it. That's why I know about it. Other than that, it's it's not a rocket science. So if you guys have any ideas or comments or anything you want to, want to discuss, stop me at any time. We can jump into anything. Uh, a minor level of blockchain discussion would be, uh, would be good too. So if you have any questions regarding that as well, because NFTs are built on top of blockchain, I would, I would, highly encourage anything you want to discuss regarding that. Uh, with that, I'll share my screen and then we can jump in. Okay, so how many of you know what uh, uh, what blockchain or fungible tokens crypto is? Because I can jump into that a little bit before I can uh, uh, jump into non-fungible tokens. Maybe show of hands or maybe just like yay, nay. I'll, I'll, I'll look at the, the comment section, that's okay too. Okay, so I'll explain like a minorly what a blockchain is, minorly without going in much detail. But blockchain is built for, to solve the problem called trust. Whenever you have a problem between multiple parties that one doesn't trust the other, other party to do what they're supposed to, well, write a contract and then everyone will follow. In this case, you write a contract in a software terms and everyone follows the contract, and the contract is enforced by the entire network of people that are do, that are that are supporting the network. Now, one may ask, what is the network in nutshell? Well, in in a nutshell, it's a database replicated to uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of machines, sometimes hundreds of thousands of machines. And now, if one person says my database is changed, everyone else would be like, nope didn't change and you know exactly who did it wrong, they get penalized and then everyone who finds out who did something wrong gets aborted. And that's, in a nutshell, that's what blockchain is about. I'm not trying to go into like technicalities on how this particular part is implemented, but in a nutshell, it's, it's, a, it's a database that is publicly visible and then copied to each and every computer who's supporting the network. And because some, it's everyone knows, everyone is transparent about it, if someone tries to screw up with it, then, someone can automatically identify. So that's the simplest form of blockchain to someone who understands software. And I assume that everyone in this uh, call has years of experience into software development or Linux uh, machine setup and, and they're technical savvy for sure. So that's blockchain. Now blockchain has multiple use cases and decentralized finance was the major use case where it started with, where Bitcoin being the finance uh, uh, solution to everything that happened in 2008. So that's how blockchain started, or sorry, blockchain adoption started as part of Bitcoin. And then over the time, there have been multiple, multiple use cases that people have experimented with it. Some have worked, uh, some have failed. Uh, something that has worked is decentralized finance in the Ethereum, smart contracts. Uh, I'm gonna just pass through all those keywords and not explain them. If you guys want to jump in, I can have, I'm happy to do it at the end. Uh, but one use case that we're going to talk today about is non-fungible token. So let's start with what a non-fungible token means. So before that, a little bit background about myself. Uh, yeah, there you go. Click. So I, I basically run a software development shop based in Toronto. Some of our clients, you can see the logos. I'll share the links if you want to do uh, or, or what you want to want to see. So before jumping into a de that description on why we are even talking about NFTs, right? Like NFT as a use case has been out there for more than 
two years uh, or probably even four years if you if you see some of the other solutions like crypto kitties you may have heard of and all that but why suddenly everyone start talking about it well in january february nba top shot they did 230 million dollars in trading buying and trading of digital, digital collectibles uh, of nba highlights what they were in a nutshell is a clips of from the season that people can have bragging rights to owning it and i'm using owning as in like a, a double quotes here uh, they are not really owned by the users they are still owned by nba but it's like trading cards where you feel like you own uh the trading card means you have something to brag with your friends saying hey look look how cool this thing is and nba stop shot created this uh, whole solution around this and uh, uh got a huge amount of traction uh the this underlying solution where the 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 collectible the the trading card was built on was nft so that's one reason to do that this is another uh hype that has recently came in this uh, uh nft space in february one art uh from from an artist named Beepo uh was sold for 69 million dollars making it making him the 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 artist Beeple, third most valuable living artist by just one sale and the whole entire sale was done in terms of ethereum so there was a crypto billionaire with a b sold bought this art for 69 billion dollar worth 69 million dollar worth of ethereum and that that is going around that is going around the news since it happened uh, if you have seen pictures and what is happening in bitcoin miami this week people is all over the place he's just trying to like just thank everyone saying guys thanks for making me this big artist i didn't deserve it but thank you anyways kind of thing so people this particular major event that happened recently uh there are there is this one yeah of course <laughs> i forgot this almost uh jack dorsey the f when he created that twitter the first setup tweet that he created was just setting up my twitter when he created that, that tweet uh, he didn't know that after roughly 15 to 20 years he will just take a screenshot of that and that screenshot will be sold as 2.9 million dollars the underlying technology again where he took the screenshot and immortalized it on blockchain was was used by nft so that is the whole reason behind nfts nfts are basically representation of your ownership on chain on blockchain so what are non-fungible tokens right like what are the non-fungible tokens so let's before even for understanding non-fungible tokens let's understand what fungible token means so what we have in our pocket like fiat currency is fungible if i have one dollar and if you have one dollar and we are happy to just swap between us without exchanging real value because we know that both one dollar has the same value to both of us it's fungible asset so fiat is a fungible asset uh, uh, basically one one liter of petrol can be a fungible asset uh, anything that has the same value without different perception is the same is is fungible token so what is non-fungible non-fungible is well, different people have different value attached to it. So my car has a different value, sentimental value attached to it. So I have higher value or lower value, or I know something that in my car that uh, the bu potential buyer may not know. So I have lower value for my car than the potential buyer, right? So that is a fun non-fungible uh, asset where you don't really have the same valuation metric that the other person would have. Art is one of the biggest example like if you if i personally look at mona lisa painting i personally would not be mesmerized because i freaking don't understand art i tried my best believe me but i don't understand art and i'm like okay that is a smiling lady i can appreciate the strokes i appreciate that 15 20 years like uh sorry centuries ago there was not the the art uh the technology was not de developed enough so how much patient it required and everything i can appreciate it but pricing it in millions is something that I cannot comprehend in my head. Uh, so that's a non-fungible token. Art is a non-fungible token. Collectibles, where if I have a special card, if book signed by the author themselves, 
non-fungible, but book by itself may be fungible. So this is how two assets are different. And now let's look at a crypto example. Bitcoin, one Bitcoin in my pocket is this, has the same value as one Bitcoin in your wallet. It's the same Bitcoin, so the, it's fungible asset. Ethereum is a fungible asset. ERC721, which is an NFT code, it's a non-fungible token. So again, I know I went into way big deeper in terms of fungible versus non-fungible, but uh, I, I, I wanted to make this distinguish. Uh, this is this very clear because non-fungible tokens in certain forms is not valuable to me or us or people who understand R or not, but some people it can be super valuable. Uh, so why 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 do we create NFTs on Ethereum? So let's look at like again the blockchain use case. What is blockchain really used for? And blockchain can always 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 make sure I'm going from bottom to bottom to top. By the way, so first of all, blockchain is immutable. Means once it's done, no one can really change it. Now, how do we do it? Happy to jump into it. Conversation for some other time though. Uh, it's transparent. As I said, the database is connected by, the database is visible by each and every one. Even you, if you're not running the node or the database, anyone can really look at what database, what's going on. So it's transparent. So you know exactly if someone says, I own 10 Ethereum, you can verify if they own 10 Ethereum or not. So it's super trans, uh, super transparent. Programmable. Uh, the reason the and this is one of the major fundamentals of Ethereum versus Bitcoin. So Ethereum as a blockchain is programmable. Bitcoin, not so much. It is partially, but not as much. So programmability, what uh, I, I'll, I'll have to explain a little bit of smart contract here. So I'll do that uh, uh, in order to understand it. Smart contract is uh, it's an enclosed piece of code that runs as part of the virtual machine on blockchain. And when it runs on that particular virtual machine, uh, it's it's the same code that runs on every machine and has the same output. Somehow I'm losing the word for that in my head right now, but uh, it's a constant function. You will, no matter, no, it's not really a constant function. There's a word for it, shit. If anyone you can remember that word, it's a there's a programming term for that. Anyways, if I find it, I'll send it as a link. <laughs> but all I'm trying to immutable. say is, uh, not not immutable. It's more like uh, uh, no matter no matter where you execute the function, no matter where you no, what the uh, uh, who's running it, where you where where it's running, the output remains the same for each and every one who's running it. Portable. Oh uh, yeah, we can call it portable for sure. Uh, there, there is there is a specific word that I'm not triggering in my head, but and not not not. Not a major part. Let's just take it as it is, like portable and uh, uh, the other use. Basically, justify the word the same way, where uh, it's consistent everywhere. So that's why blockchain. That, that that's what the smart contracts are. Smart contract is basically a, a programmable way to to write contracts, somewhat legal in some cases, uh, to be on chain and make sure that they are executed and enforced by the entire network all at the same time. So. I can write a code that says, hey, Warren and I go in the deal, and after 10 days, if the weather is X, the money goes into Warren's account. Uh, if the weather is below 34, if the weather goes above 434, then the money goes in my account, and I can write that code, and no one, no one means no one, even the, uh, like the, the hosting provider, which in this case no one is, they can do anything about it. Like no CEOs can change it, no influencer can change it. Once the code is written, code is going to execute. So that's uh, that. That's the programmability part of it. Uh, indisputable, uh, because everything is transparent and immutable. Uh, it can be. It can never be disputed that what is there and what is not. It's always always present. And now finally, unique and unique is the NFT part, non fungible part. You can create a token token as in like digital asset that is unique enough that no one can ever copy it and say this is belonging to me so for example if you create an nft and if that nft is basically on on uh, uh, if that nft is basically owned by you then it remains on your and your side only 
Uh, I see some question. Let's see what question that was here. But we can go that in right after, uh, for sure. Uh, so next. So the history behind it. So who created the first NFT? So CryptoPunk. So uh, I don't know how, how visible it is, but if you see here, uh, there, are, there are lots of faces from different backgrounds, different genders, different races, different hairstyles. This is programmatically created 10,000 faces. And those 10 faces were named CryptoPunk art. And CryptoPunk art was, was uh, 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 basically launched in 2017, roughly the, uh, almost the early days of the hype cycle of Ethereum. And till date, roughly 8,612 uh, are generated and sold. And each one is uh, a minimum priced at around 20 Ethereum. At the current rate, it will be around forty thousand dollars to fifty thousand dollars, depending on the price movement. And then, uh, all together, it's around three hundred thirty million dollars. In fact, I just I was just seeing the number, and this number has surpassed uh, roughly fifty million dollars. The average cost, average price for NFT. So, what does it give me? This particular image is owned by me and only me, and this can become my digital identity if I want to. No one else can really have it because I and only I paid for it. So that was the first CryptoPunk, uh, the first NFT. The second NFT, I don't think I put it in the link here, but uh, if you guys remember talking about CryptoKitties, CryptoKitties is like where, where, you're, where you're collecting different types of cats and uh, uh, of course, different animation cats. And then you're breeding different cats between, and then you're, you're feeding them, you're maintaining them. Uh, that's all happening while uh, uh you're on chain and that was the first when when crypto kitties were was at its peak uh there was a time when they took over 90 percent of ethereum traffic for i think couple of days uh entirely and that was uh, uh the first time where cats broke blockchain cat has broken internet many times and we have heard the stories about it where cat pictures are ha are having huge load on the internet this is the first, this was the first time when kitties uh, basically broke the entire entire blockchain where everything slowed down where your transaction were taking roughly a day or two to compile so scalability challenges for sure so in terms of nft uh by the way let, let's pause here does anyone have any ideas oh uh, sorry questions about what an nft can be uh what are nfts um, any any comments, concerns before we can jump into the landscape description? So I take yeah. it Ethereum is one blockchain, is that correct? Ethereum is one of the many blockchains, but it has 90% of the developer traction, or probably 70% now, but like they are they are they are they are the uh, uh they are they are the blockchain you want to focus on. It is the blockchain you want to focus on. You could clone Ethereum and create another Ethereum chain, right? Uh, yes, you can, but uh, 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 it depends on what you're trying to do with it. Well, of course, that's that's the story of blockchain altogether. It, uh, it wonders what you're going to do with it. Well, if I if I wanted to sell an NFT a second time, I could start another blockchain and sell NFTs on that blockchain, right? Uh, technically, yes. Uh, behaviorally, no, because what will happen is technically, yes, you can copy paste the entire blockchain and call it your Ethereum 2.0 yourself or, or, or uh, uh, it, it's, it's huge, right? So uh, it's basically like you can just call it Ethereum Edge uh, and that particular one, you can run it, but who else is going to recognize that as a major blockchain? If well, no one can... else is recognizing as a major blockchain, is it really a network? Right, but everybody else might come to it if I offer discounts. Oh, um, you know, discounts like, to a point. Like, what what kind of discount? Like that that NFT doesn't exist. Uh, the purpose of NFT is that you have the ownership, and you have the ownership in a way where where others recognize that as as the ownership that cannot be broken. If you create your own Ethereum, you're using words in a very tricky way here. 
because NFTs sure. do not actually designate ownership. For instance, if you if there's any term in which an intellectual intellectual property can be owned, like this, it would be copyright. And NFTs do mm -hmm. not represent copyright. So um, the actual owner isn't mm -hmm. the person who buys the NFT. It's just the NFT owner. I understand that and then it's slippery what the hell that actually means that's not entirely true it depends on the person who minted the nft so the creator the author can determine the terms so nba top shot you are 100 percent correct nba owns the all rights to it but in terms of what people are there's no the the ownership the author uh transfers so author transfers the ownership of that particular art to the buyer completely giving up all their rights uh, to the to the buyer themselves. So it depends on who's printing it. CryptoPunk is the same way. So if you look at the document that covers this, I assume it's the contract, the Ethereum contract. And I don't believe the I I could be wrong, but I don't yet believe that the world legal system has recognized an Ethereum contract as being legally binding. I can chime in definitely, but Warren wanna say something. So go ahead, Warren. In terms of the trickiness, I kind of have the feeling that um, because it's sort of an emergent thing, the definitions aren't necessarily very solid. And I don't think anybody's trying to be tricky, but, um, and then the, the ownership is another kind of funny thing. Like if you own um, uh, Van Gogh's sunflowers, um, one of the things that happened, you know, decades ago is all kinds of university students had, you know, a copy of Sunflowers in their, in their, the rooms, right? Um, and that probably did not devalue uh, the original, it probably increased the value of the original in this, you know, kind of weird way. Um, and similarly, this doesn't have to be exclusive. Um, it can work more in terms of providing money for the original artist. Um, and that too is kind of a bit tricky, but in that, like the first person or the, the if, for instance, Damon Hirst, I think, has announced that he's going to uh, publish something, um, and so the one that provides money to the actual artist is going to have legitimacy and therefore value. And if you get a copy that's not legitimate, it won't have value just because, you know, socially it doesn't have that. Um, but I think it's all kind of emerging. And I kind of feel like yeah. tokens in a game are going to be more significant because the gaming and, and how people think about that is going to evolve a lot more from where we are even now. Well, it's, anyway, a, social, up, you know? it's a social construct. And yes. It's intellectual property, which we're more used to. And yes. Real things. But even mm -hmm. in that stuff, it's very surprising to people. Like, for instance, friends of my parents bought um, a piece of artwork from a Canadian artist. Mm -hmm. And then he had the right to request it back to make copies for his book. They couldn't say no. <laughs> so, so it depends on what you buy, right? Like, it's like when your parents bought it, like, did they look at the terms? That's the question. No, so that's what it comes down to. There are no terms. This is just under Canadian law. When you buy art, this is how it works. Oh, I will disagree heavily with that. I just yeah. took a copyright course, and I think that is dead wrong. If it was signed in a contract agreement that the artist had the right to take it back, that's one thing. Canadian copyright law does not guarantee that right at all. Yep. Well, it, they took it to a lawyer, and the lawyer said the artist did have that right. Then that might have been the TNC that the buyer didn't read. There weren't any in those days. And that might have changed. Good, so, good discussion. Well, let's let's move on. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, to be honest, uh, Alan, like this is like this is this is the fun part of the discussion. Like I can give the names and everything, but anyone can literally look at the name and then research. And I, this like I'm uh, like I can send the links and people can read over all the links. I can answer all the questions. I can give all those uh, other use cases and everything. But what, what we are discussing here is where we are trying to figure out like what the use case of NFT most most challenge are. So it's I'm totally okay if people wanna stay here and spend half an hour on this. If 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 you're okay with that, of course. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so just to answer, like, uh, use uh, uh, concern, and I'm pretty sure, like, I had the same concerns, and that's why I talked to a few lawyers myself just to understand this. Plus, there were some good articles written about the NBA Top Shot. So I'll compare NBA Top Shot with CryptoPunks. There are two particular use cases, and I'll probably stop sharing my screen, uh, and then so that you can see, uh, like, somewhat somewhat facial expressions as well that might help with uh, uh, the whole thing. So there are there are two particular. Uh, extremes of where where nft collectibles market there are other use cases i'm talking about collectibles market itself slash art market so nft art one example is nba top shot which is completely the brand of course nba built by uh, uh flow uh, uh built on flow blockchain by uh, by the team the same team created uh, uh crypto kitties so that's one example. The second one is CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks is uh, the oldest idea on how NFTs were created. And all the images that you see there are programmatically generated based on certain earlier parameters. So there are two types. NBA Top Shot, what you're seeing is exactly what it is. It's uh, uh, the, the owner slash NBA has all rights and reserve so that no one can use the copy without their permission. No one can stream that. It's only for themselves and their friends. They can show it off in their wallet and their wallet only. You cannot take it out too much. Uh, so there are lots of terms and conditions attached to it. The other use case is CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks are literally the faces as I showed earlier where those are programmatically generated faces depending on certain criteria. Those are giving the owner the complete ownership of what they do with those images, whether it's uh, uh, whether they do it for, whether they just trash it, whether they use it for other purposes completely. Uh, uh, like I can literally shit talk about those images if I owned one of them and say, this is stupid and I can talk all the way and that does not reflect on the artist itself. So. There are, there are two types, and it all depends on the original uh, uh, contract or the agreement or TOC, T, TNC created by the artist when it was created. To my knowledge, and I can go and verify it one more time, but Beeple's art that was sold for 69 million, first 100 days, for sorry, first 1,000 days, something like that, uh, was the same thing, where the buyer gets the complete right to do whatever he wants to do from that and I'm using here because I know that it was I know who bought it like every, it's public, so the the buyer can decide whatever they want to do with that art going forward. So that's the dilemma here. It's the author and the buyer has to be wary of what they are really purchasing uh, going there. Uh, your second concern is a very good concern about the can I just fork Ethereum and then create a copy of it? Uh, partially, Warren Warren answered it uh, where I can just like copy an art and then now does it really if i copy mona lisa do i have the mona lisa or not <laughs> that's the real question and uh, uh well if you try to resell it they will simply ask what is the provenance here and uh, it will come with a provenance uh, uh, report and on uh, all the previous known on owners uh of that particular uh art and eventually uh uh like, like eventually it will uh, uh, even see the originator who bought who, who basically bought the first time and the author themselves. It's possible. Um, so I hope I answer your question. Well, there's some tricky parts here. I'm thinking about the real art world. Mm -hmm. This painting that my parents' friends bought was a single painting. And the artist decided to make a print series based on it. Well, you can see that, the, that there's nothing there that he broke any rules, the artist, but he did potentially devalue this one of a kind thing by turning it into print series. And in the in the art world, it's very common to have print series with a range on them. Like you'll say one of 200. Yeah. You're, as an artist promising you're not going to make more than 200, just for example. All these things are pretty tricky. Absolutely. And oh, absolutely. And, and the art is different, right? Like, the, again, the TNC, I don't know on that one, so I can't really speak to that for sure. Anyway, in in there's several ways which you could legally protect things. One of them is copyright law. Yep. One of them is contract law. One is trademark. Um, and... What? 
trademark to protect yeah. you could trademark an image okay Only if it's associated with a brand for the purpose of commerce well don't you think nba is a brand don't you think NBA. a lot of their things become brands Okay, we're really, we're really going down a black hole here. NBA is a brand associated with a company trying to sell entertainment. An individual image is not a trademark unless you turn it into a brand like Michael Jordan and so on. But no, generic photos are not trademarks. So okay. I'm not saying it's the it's the way. I'm saying it's a way. You could engineer it. It doesn't matter to my point. So... Can I can I bring this conversation from what the, the the governance for a country or legislation for a country can be to what what blockchain can help to achieve in this case? So uh, in in this context, uh, there are two things. Uh, I want to also answer the question that was that is posed to you. It's like everything is public. Like did I hear that right? I'll answer that as well. So let me answer that for a few minutes. It's a small answer. Uh, it's pseudonymous. So basically your your ownership is represented by a public address like like literally a literally a hash 64 character string like sha256 uh and from sha256 sha if you go and say that that this sha256 belongs to me then people know who that is otherwise people don't know who that sha256 is so it's pseudonymous not a complete anonymous thing like, people know who has it but people don't know who that person is does that answer that question? That's 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 the first thing. Clear as mud. Perfect. Uh, so, and and the second thing is, uh, what can NFT really do here? Is uh, uh, NFT can in like just like uh, uh, like as I said in the first slide, like there is no dispute who really owns it, and this happens in the art world all the time, where you create a copy, and if the copy is as good as the original, then you have two circulating copies. And there have been cases in the past where someone says, I've given you the original, but they've kept the original and given a copy of that to the to the buyer and sold us the fake provenance uh, to the uh, to the buyer. So with NFT, you can certain you can definitely avoid those kind of scenarios. As long as the person on the buyer on the other side is technical enough, that or or whoever is doing the due diligence technical enough, they can verify the entire trail of purchases. But if the government enforces or not. I don't think we are there yet, um, but in in there's there's one, and I'm not a lawyer, so please bear with me. I, I'm making an assumption here, but uh, but to my knowledge, if there is an inclination, whatever the right thing to do is, that's what it is. Like if you sold something and if you give them fake, that's definitely a wrong thing to do, and then there's definitely a way to way to go after that kind of behavior. So, I don't think the problem is legal here. I think the problem is human. Uh, isn't that always? <laughs> no, no. But what I'm saying is, falling falling back on legalities, I think is 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 the wrong way to go. And I think it's to me, it's a diversion that doesn't help with some of the real questions. Okay, well, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll get to one. I, I want to get to some of the questions I posted in the chat. Yeah, please. In the same presentation, right here in front of us, you just posted Jack Dorsey's tweet. Right. You posted a screenshot of that tweet. Is yes. it genuine? Is the one that NFT backed? No, I don't care. You used it to communicate information to me, and the value of that and that content was useful between you and me and this group right now. And the existence of some original copy as an NFT might be good for somebody that's got more money than they know what to do with. But in terms of <laughs> in terms of a social yep. goal, what is the point? The fact that you could the fact that you could post that NFT, the copy of that NFT, that tweet, you're not breaking any copyright laws by doing it. It just means you don't have an NFT backed, genuinely gold embossed version of that of that digital tweet. To which I don't have the boasting is, right to. You're to which, you're absolutely right. To which the answer is to us normal people that actually spend our money on useful things. What is the point? So, so you're absolutely right. So now we are for the NFT in the collectibles market. Uh, if I can stretch myself, none. Like being very honest, uh, if if you if you're not the person who shows off anything, 
then I don't think NFT collectibles use case is for you. And that's okay. I'm not that kind of person as well. No, but it's worse than that, okay? A, a trading card, you can show to somebody and Opichi and Tops don't have the right to restrict who you can show it to or who you can give it to, right? Yeah. Even though it's Major League Baseball license or whatever, you can take that card and do whatever you want. Yeah. Same thing with any any kind of collectible you can hold in your hand. So, so holding your hand has different uh, meanings. So let me just give another example, and I'm not trying to cut the example of the other example. So sorry about that. I'm not trying to use that logic, but you have you hold a credit card does not mean hold you like you're holding a cash, like like a stash of cash. You still can transact with it because that is intrinsic value that when you swipe it, you're authorizing someone to do it. Now, where I'm going with this regarding NFT, if I have a wallet where you can say, hey, I own this 10 NFTs and I can swipe through it and then show all to my friends, or if I can do certain, like certain, and there are people who are creating digital frames right now, which can only show the NFTs that you own and nothing else. And there are, there are people are creating more use cases out of that. Those are the real use cases that can that can suffice to what you're saying. And the moment you take a screenshot of each of those images, you can share them with anyone you want. They're not NFT backed. But again, in terms of I want to show you this image, yeah. you can do that without having the gold plated NFT version and Agreed. you're still conveying the information. As you absolutely. Said. That's so, the beauty of it. You're absolutely right. Like I, I can I can show the information and say this is useful, and I can sh show the information and say I own it. Two different use cases, and NFT basically allows me to have both in a separate cases. You're absolutely right. So outside of bragging rights, I don't get the point. This is all you. I mean, to me, I absolutely. look at what happens with NFT, and it just tells me there's people that can spend sixty nine million dollars on something of a digital thing that can be shared for free. And that just tells me that some people have more money than they know what to do with. And if you're talking about causing social unrest by pointing to income disparity, this is the way to do it. <laughs> awesome. So uh, I, I do not disagree with you. I completely don't agree with you as well, but I don't disagree with you there. Two point, if you look at any art, you can put it in the same context then. Like you look at any art and that's the same thing. Even the physical copy of it, like you're literally showing off your back. Nothing else. What are you doing with it other than that? So it's the same context. So if if you treat the art the same way, then your view on NFT is correct. Otherwise, uh, debatable. But let me jump into another other use cases. Then, like I agree with you, collectible use cases is one. And from my like, I Warren knows my view on it. I basically think it's a uh, it, it's it's definitely uh, a I would say it's hyped. Uh, I'm not saying it's not a real use case. It's definitely more hyped than it is useful right now. And there are a couple other use cases, and I'll give you a couple of them. A couple of the use cases where people are people are exploring with this. One use case is uh, uh, people are buying designer T-shirts for 600, 700 bucks, and on top of that, people would people are going in virtual scenarios, like whether it's Decentraland, which is another uh, uh, virtual uh, virtual place to be, then all the online gaming where you can have digital assets. If I can buy a particular brand of T-shirt in a virtual form from e-commerce stores and then wear that while I'm playing that particular game, which people are doing all the time, that's where like virtual commerce come into place. And now the similar example is if you look at early 2000, there were lots of people who were buying emoji packs. They were buying this like stickers, uh, and that's that was the main. Uh, uh, business model for Yahoo Messenger and then MSN and a couple other people. It's the same idea. You basically have something. So those stickers in the NFT land, which is more indisputable, like if you look at those emoji packs, I can copy paste those emoji packs somehow. But if I look at those NFT packs, you cannot copy paste and then start owning it. So you can say that this is emoji pack 2.0. If you want, if you don't like calling it NFT, call it emoji pack 2.0. But that's a use case that people are consistently exploring in this direction. Uh, that's one use case. Another use case, like more tangible use case, is uh, uh, which is more like tangible use cases are either you make someone money or you you save someone money. That's how we generally see anything in terms of use cases, or it saves me time. So in 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 uh, in this NFT case, there are there is uh, warrants, uh, as in like when when I buy a product. 
my warranties and guarantees, like when I get that piece of paper, those piece of paper can be given as an NFT. And there are a couple of companies who are trying that out as well. Now, when you sell those products, you're giving that NFT as part of it to show that this is an original product and I'm giving you the original warranty to go with it for the next three years, it will still last you. And those are very useful. And currently somebody can literally print the same like warranty book, paper book, and then they can copy it and suddenly you have a new warranty. In this case, it is totally indisputable that whether you have warranty or not. So those are the real use cases that are coming Next couple of years, it will take time, of course, because not everyone has a wallet that can hold NFTs. But these are the very useful cases that will start developing in the next few months, years, as soon as the and as soon as the hype on the collectibles like fade a little bit low. I hope I answer your question, though. I, I, you did. I'm I'm especially interested in pursuing what Warren said about you know the idea of doing this as micropayments and that kind of thing. Where, where it might have potential, but then again, it's competing with existing technologies. Um, I did not get the micropayment idea. Warren, you wanna, you wanna explain that? Um, well, I, I would just said that I suspect that um, NFTs um, for low value NFTs will become very interesting. Uh, like things that are used in games and stuff. Um, one of the examples, uh, of the Beeple art, not the famous one, but he sold some other artists. Uh, somebody bought a bunch of them. Um, they got some architect to build some virtual um, gallery. Galleries, he put yeah. the art up. He contracted musicians to uh, perform live and people like thousands, I don't, I, I didn't hear about this, but uh, thousands of people attended. And then all of the artists who contributed got it paid out of you know their contribution um and so that was kind of interesting and yep. whether or not it's significant it kind of demonstrates i think where this part of where this might be going um so kind of, you're absolutely right like that that virtual ar vr uh experience based on your art or the ownership or the excess token that you have that's a very specific uh, example and then uh check out the uh, for anyone who's looking for it decentraland uh decentraland is a virtual uh, landscape where people are buying different properties and then setting up casinos and art and and the and the entire uh, shows uh, on that particular uh, virtual property and the, like there are literally physical artists shaping up as virtual artists and then streaming their music in a particular location that does not go outside of that location. So there are lots of experiments going on and I'm using my words carefully. Experiments they are not completely successful yet, but those experiments will yield to many interesting use cases. Uh, another use case that, that I am quite honestly uh, excited about is the patronage use case. So for example, like uh, uh, I put, if I like particular YouTube channel, I can subscribe to their, uh, uh, I can not only subscribe to the channel, but I can, there is, there is something called a patron service where I can just pay them $5 a month uh, on to, to support their support their work. Now in return, they could give me some kind of access as an NFT badge or something that I can flash on my Twitter, LinkedIn, anywhere I want to, and then say, I support this. And because I can support this, that can also give me some kind of access to certain certain Discord channels or Telegram groups or WhatsApp groups or, or, or email thread or uh, a subscription newsletter. So an NFT uh, uh, basically acting as a proof of uh, patronage and, and it also gives you some kind of access that is not available to you. And that gives you indisputable access, whether, and there cannot be any biases, whether, whether you're a different gender, different race, different society, different country, and then you can still have the access. As long as you do X, you get Y. So those kind of systems are being developed right now. And personally speaking, that's where I think the NFT will really shine. But that's what I mean by going into a competitive technology, because there already are badging systems all over the place, including, you know, Mozilla Open Badging, which can be implemented by anyone as, a, as an open source solution. And yeah. so that's what I'm saying is when it comes to some of these other things, when it comes to, you know, uh, using 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 NFTs as a replacement for an elect for a digital signature, as using it as a replacement for badging, it has to cope and compete with what in some cases are already mature technologies that are not going to be disrupted overnight. 
Oh, absolutely not. You're absolutely right. Like it, it's not going to be disrupted overnight. It's going to take a lot of time. And that's why I keep repeating NFT collectibles is a hype uh, that has, in my opinion, already faded in last like two months to like, it has already lost its 80% value in my opinion. And now in a month or two or probably six time frame, we're going to start seeing some major use cases coming after that. So, uh, Again, I, I think we all are speaking, speaking the same thing. <laughs> What's the minimum cost mm -hmm. of doing an Ethereum transaction, like putting something on the blockchain? I, 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 huge, let me just say that. Uh, it can go from $3 to $300, uh, especially uh, sometimes even higher depending on the traffic. And uh, when, when I was like four months, sorry, four weeks ago, four to six weeks ago, I had to do a transaction for a client and that was costing minimal smart contract deployment. The deployment costed me around 450 US. And it was, in a generally, it should not cost me more than like five bucks. Because it was a high traffic, it was a time sensitive deployment, 450 bucks, we paid for it. So it, it varies and right now it's quite high. Uh, although there are lots of solutions being developed right now, whether it's like optimistic rollups, ZK rollups, uh, Arbitrum, Matic, like I, I, I don't want to just overwhelm and just give the random words. I can jump into any of them. Trust me. My, what I'm trying to say is uh, fees, gas fees, uh, and scalability are extremely big problems. At the same time, if you put enough smart minds to that problem, the solutions come out. And people have been working for last two or two and a half years on the scalability challenges. And many solutions have already come out and are in the adoption phases already. So I wouldn't want, I would not much worry about the gas phases, uh, sorry, gas, uh, gas prices uh, in, a, in, a, in a medium to long term. Short term, you're absolutely right. So it seems to me that there's also an issue of um, energy efficiency, but I just expressed it in dollars. Um, sure, yeah. Now, the obvious solution is some kind of batching where you batch a bunch of things together as one entry on a ledger. I don't know whether you can do that. Um, just a different name. Just call it rollups, and you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, like, it, it, like in a nutshell, it's the same. Like, you know, like every smart mind thinks the same way. Uh, and like you, you, you thought about batching. They call rollups. Now, the only concern with the rollup versus batching is rollups have to be decentrally uh, indisputable. So there are some other parameters added in that uh, transaction batch or transactions batch that uh, you make sure that no one can really uh, sneak in uh, uh, an unfair or illegitimate transaction in it. So there are some extra checks that going on, but that will like that batching will allow people to have one transaction, it just does everything for them instead of running 100 transactions. So you're absolutely right. Uh, so that is, there are two solutions that are prominent in the Ethereum community. Uh, one is called optimistic rollup, and another one is called ZK rollup. ZK means zero knowledge rollups. Uh, optimistic ro ZK, ro ZK rollup is uh, superior technology than optimistic rollup, and many people will come and dispute me with this. Happy to discuss. Uh, and But the optimistic rollup is gaining more traction due to its simplicity and, uh, uh, and 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 support with uh, migration of the existing code without changing anything. So in in Ethereum terms, uh, they are EVM op optimistic rollup or EVM Ethereum virtual machine compatible, and they call it OVMs optimistic virtual machine. So that's why optimistic is getting more traction than zk. Uh, long run, I feel like, and I could be totally proven wrong in the future, which is zk rollup can be more uh, uh, can be more prominent solution as soon as we, we start developing it. So those are the two technologies you might want to look into if you want to, if you're interested in batching transaction in Ethereum terms. Okay. You probably made a mistake in naming. When I think of optimistic, I think of, I hope it works. <laughs> oh, so, no, no, I, I didn't make in the name. Like I didn't think of optimistic in that way. But no, it is optimistic. Rollup is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more probabilistically can be broken, but at high volume, no, it cannot be. 
uh, zero knowledge proof ZK rollups are uh, technically superior, but uh, they are not compatible with the existing uh, basically technology as is. It, it requires many migrations before we can reach that. So no, it's it's it is optimistic rollup, believe me. But I get the joke. <laughs> I forgot why it was called optimistic perfectly, so I'll probably research that. Uh, any anything else? I, I, I would like to only cover one more slide, so I can just give you the the breadth uh, the the breadth of other uh, uh, experiments that are being run in the industry right now. And after that, we can of course go back into this discussion mode whenever you guys like. So uh, give me a second. Let me know by, when you guys can see it. It's there. Yeah, it's up. OK. I lost that window now. Got it. OK. Uh, so if if you, this slide, you can Google this. This is Google worthy, not a big deal. Uh, if you want to search for what, just like just like any any particular innovation, that has to be a standard so that everyone is not reinventing the same wheel over and over. It's uh, you just want to check out ERC seven twenty one and EIP two nine eight one. It's basically a standard on. Uh, you can look at it as an like an interface of what function to call in order to print, mint, uh, transfer, approve all those in NFTs. So uh, you'll you'll find the uh, the the programmable interface layer on what the ERC seven twenty one is. But but this is where the fun things really really be begin, and I'll just go through some of them, not all of them. But uh, uh, Radible is uh, is is the marketplace. So Radible or OpenSea and uh, uh, Rare, there are, there are a hundred more uh, different marketplaces where artists can go in, and then they can buy, uh, sell, mint all the basically actions for their identities, and of course buyers can go and buy. Uh, resell and uh, all the other parts from the NFT. One fun part about that is, and this is where NFT programmability, com programmability comes in, where is in the contract itself, I can write the contract that whenever as an on, as an uh, author or as, a, as an artist, if my art is ever sold to uh, in the future to anyone, I will get 30% of the next sell. So if you look at like uh, the, any original artist, their first art do not that well, but subsequently they're, they they get better and better. And then even the original, like like when they were like four years old, those paintings get sold for higher prices. And artists do not really benefit from it. In in blockchain, in the NFT space, you can program that as part of the code where whenever this particular uh, NFT change his hand from X user to Y user, I want the 30% of the sale that happened. It's not, and there is a standard being developed for that so that all the marketplaces are working on the same assumptions. So that's a very interesting point of view for the NFTs. Uh, LizardDAO is uh, another very interesting solution. What they do, oh, by the way, uh, can I assume that uh, people understand what DAO is or should I explain that in a, in a minute? Okay, please, shortly. Please explain. Okay, awesome. So DAO is decentralized autonomous organizations. So it's like corporation, but not a legal entity, of course. So DAO is like a corporation, a company that is run by people, and all their voting, all their decision making, all their actions are done on chain. On chain, as in everything is transparent, immutable. Like all the five, like the same five things I've been repeating over and over on this call. Those all things are happening as particular DAO, decentralized autonomous organization. So DAO. Now, DAOs can be used to do so many things. Like like one of the major DAO examples that I personally like is there are many VC venture capitalists DAO on blockchain, which just literally come and uh, uh, fund different projects uh, and say, hey, I like your project. Let's do internal voting and then fund that particular uh, uh, that, that new project and that whole process, the VC venture capitalism process is uh, uh, maintained by a DAO. So that's what a DAO is in a nutshell. Uh, Pleaser DAO is uh, NFT related DAO 
that invests into NFTs only. So Blizzard DAO, as a, as a as collectively as a group, bids on different NFT and NFT projects, and then eventually it will appreciate in value. If it does, everyone gets the equal risk and reward uh, opportunities. So that's what that is. Uh, personally speaking, facement not important right now. But let's forget it. Let's move to the next one. Upshot. Upshot is NFT price discovery. So how do you really value? what the value, or how do you really value an NFT? Is it $5 million, is it $5, is $5,000? What is the value? Upshot is democratized uh, crowdfunding way to find the value of it. In a nutshell, they create a survey and then ask everyone. And if your answer is close to what everyone is thinking, then you get a person of, uh, then you get a portion of some tokens or some kind of reward based on, based on your correctness of your answer. And that goes towards Pricing, pricing that particular art. Uh, now, why do you want to put in put a number to the art? Well, if that's the case, then you can use that art as a collateral, and then that collateral can be used to to release some some loan on the other side. So, MakerDAO and a couple other uh, uh, projects are working on uh, NFT lending protocols where you can lend your NFT in return you lend their their own tokens and you can use their tokens to do other things. So that is a whole decentralized finance aspect to it. Uh, and NFT20 is an index fund, but instead of holding stock or crypto as an asset, they hold top 20 art as an asset. So if the whole NFT market goes up, you have to something that goes up with it as well. Uh, I know I ran through this slide like last two quite fast because they both are connected. Uh, I am happy to chat about those two. And personally speaking, there are other use cases, but I don't have links or anything in that. But everything is Googleable. Uh, but I can I can spend more time on this slide uh, to 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 end the conversation. The next slide looked interesting. Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through it quickly. So other NFT use cases, so property deed. So I can have a property because property is non-fungible. One property is not replaceable by other property. Each and every property, just as another asset, can be an NFT. That way, no one can really dispute who that property is owned by. You can never dispute that. Plus, it's a public record. And it's a pseudonymous record, so that you can you can basically have all the verification and still keep everything secret if you if you choose to. So that's one. Uh, car ownership, just like any other asset, car ownership is the same thing. And that way, no one can really basically even if you steal a car, that is a quick verification that is this car stolen or not, without even looking at the paper around it. So that's another one. Insurance and claims. So. So your insurance claims can be an NFT. Instead of carrying a regular card, you can have the NFT uh, that, that you can carry. And because now it's a programmable NFT, you can have automated insurance uh, uh, monthly premiums paid to that NFT. And then you know you can keep always the NFT up and running. Uh, so I, sorry, insurance up and running. And claims, whenever you make a claim, your claim can automatically come into as part of your your insure like your NFT value itself. So you can again do it in a very transparent, pseudonymous fashion. Uh, I have a question about that. Yes, please. Okay. When I need to prove insurance right now for the purpose of anything, be it renewing my plate or whatever, yep. I have a little pink sheet of paper that my insurance company gives me. Absolutely. Okay. If I want to walk into Service Ontario and indicate I still have insurance, I still have to have something physically on me. Yeah. So I'm replacing the piece of paper with something else physical that has my NFT on it. Oh, I would say more digital than physical, but uh, le like uh, le let's see where, where your use case you're, you're pushing. So it's more like I will show it on my phone rather than somewhere else. Or so, so this is... A, this is the use case that people have explored quite a bit. Like if you if you show that pink slip, 
it has more information than what the other person needs to know that you're passing to. Uh, in that case, if there is a way where you just scan a QR code on the other side, and because you own an NFT, you are automatically authorized. So the person sitting on the other side of the, the desk will never have to ask you any questions other than, hey, what's your card number? Boom, boom, boom. You scan it, and then all the information transferred right away without, oh, oh, sorry, all the validation done without you passing any information to it. So that is generally done with zero knowledge proof. That's what zero knowledge proof is all about. Zero knowledge proof means you don't have, the other person who's verifying does not have any knowledge about who you are or anything, as long as you answer certain questions. And this is more like a mathematical questions than uh, what's your age, what's your car number kind of questions. As long as you prove some mathematical questions, you own that item, you validate that item, and you and only you can uh, claim that item without even passing all the other details. So that's a, that's a major use case of zero knowledge proofs, which theoretically can be embedded into NFTs as well. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I still think it's going to be an uphill battle to demonstrate that all of that is more mm -hmm. is more efficient than me giving somebody a pink piece of paper. Oh, absolutely. Hell yes. Like, uh, again, this use cases I'm talking about are pro some use cases are one, two years away and some are decade away because and, and it's not because of lack of technology. It's lack of adoption. We could have built Uber in like in 2000, but people would not have adopted Uber in 2000. Same problem here. Like this technology is ready. What I'm saying is technology is ready. Now people are creating the, the adoption rails right now. I hope I hope I'm clear in that. Like I don't think this will start happening tomorrow. Okay. So the big the big win of this over a centralized government database is you might be able to have your personal control over it where instead of the government controlling your information. Um, that, that's what I think. Um theoretically, yes. Theoretically, yes. Like in the zero knowledge proof item, uh, you still need a, the uh, you still need the approving party. Basically, the party who create like first of all validates you and then gives you that particular uh, verification. But in the NFT market, you're absolutely right. Where my ownership is mine and it's completely sovereign, uh, self sovereign, uh, and not relying on any other any other factor at all, like whether it's country, religion, race, blah, 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 doesn't matter on any of them at all. It's basically if I can answer that question, if I have the private keys and no one has the private keys, in indisputably, this is my asset, period. Yeah, but Hugh, you're onto something in much the same way that Bitcoin was an attempt to get away from the uh, conventional banking system. Right. It sounds like this kind of thing might be a threat to governments uh, keeping track of car ownership, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And oh, yes. governments are not likely to take this lying down. <laughs> I completely agree and with you. I think that's part of why I see uh, this kind of going through a path of um, game development that uh, somebody, people are just going to play with it. And the use case as a play thing is probably the most significant because people will come up with something brilliant that. I can't anticipate today, but you know uh, the Gen Zers will love three years in the future, um, and then something will develop from there. Um, I think these examples are just sort of you know possibilities. You can imagine somebody doing it. You can talk about the pros and cons, but yeah, absolutely. the government. Uh, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and and that's where like like that's the standard technological adoption, right? Like it happens generally in either of these three. Like gaming, porn, and finance. Like those are the three industries that will adopt new technology. Everyone else will just like start using it afterwards. So gaming, <laughs> porn, and finance. Uh, those are the three things. I'm I'm eagerly waiting to see the porn application of this. Oh, there is actually. Like I'm not like. Uh, uh, shit, what's the name of that coin? Uh, I know the founder, Amian. Uh, are you allowed to say yeah. the name of the coin in mixed company? <laughs> uh, like, yes, I can. I'm just not. It's it's not flashing in my head. Oh my god. Uh, 
anyways, like uh, there there have been people applying this technology for for the inclusivity. Uh, so so like just FYI, like uh, 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 sex workers don't get bank accounts and stuff like that, and that makes them very very susceptible to financial challenges. Like they can't get loans and so many of the problems. And uh, uh, one person I know has been working on this solution and quite prominent in the Ethereum community actually. Uh, the guy has been working on this solution for uh, for last three years. Uh, just again, I'm terrible with names, and remembering name is not my forte quite a bit. So if if I come across it, I'll send you as a link. But no porn, and they are having some solid. I wouldn't say like crazy adoption that everyone has started using it, but adoption to a point where they have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, where they can they can they can. Uh, provide more more reliable source of income to sex workers and then provide them uh, financial stability. Like if they need to get loans and stuff, then if you have earned those particular tokens, then you can use as a staking. And there is a there is, there is sound uh, economics created around that for sure. So yes, there, people have been experimenting with this and uh, so far has been has been adopted by the initial adopters, of course. It's funny how people get silent after partying, like porn discussion. I get it. <laughs> so, so have you worked with? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to ask if you had uh, experience with community tokens. I've heard of them. I haven't heard very much about them getting traction. Do you have anything to say about community tokens? So, so uh, community tokens, social tokens, patronage. They all, uh, they all basically are synonyms, in my opinion. That their their use cases will converge. Basically, it it will be something like if I own uh, certain tokens, it will give me access to certain groups of people, like minded people that I can talk to, or I will have some exclusive exclusive benefits that uh, other people who don't have it will 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 have. So, one example that I've heard. And has been gaining traction is BitCloud. Uh, they got in legal trouble as well because they because they they made some claims that they shouldn't. Uh, so BitCloud is one. Uh, the second one is not so greatly appreciated. No, sorry, appreciated is wrong word. No, not that greatly uh, adopted, but in certain circles is quite popular. Called uh, Friends with Benefit Pro where it's a token that gives you access to a certain Discord channel where literally certain friends are just keep, like basically crypto people just nerding out, right? Like that's, so there are there are, have been some uh, experiments going on. And as I said earlier, patronage, social tokens, community tokens, in my opinion, will be the biggest use case of uh, NFTs in the coming days because the, like, in my opinion, that will power the ownership economy, because now you own a piece of that particular community that is a way to represent it, and eventually will find a way to trickle down the value of the community to each and every user, financially and socially both. So, so that will also play in the big role of how uh, the ownership economy plays out as well. Again, this is completely speculative from my end. This can completely go wrong, but in my vision, they all are converging in the future. In the beginning, you talked about collectibles as being a current big use case. Yes. And I'm trying to think in the real world what's a little bit like it. And another thing that boggles my mind is naming rights. Uh huh. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, um, sir, not really. Sorry. If 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 somebody gives a ton of money to a hospital, it becomes somebody well for instance cordellucci gave a whole bunch of money to a hospital near my town and now it's called the cordellucci hospital yeah or, no so like a scotia center right like we have that problem we, we already have that roger center to scotia bank center now yeah so you're, so you're absolutely right i think that there's a lot about naming rights that's like collectability like there's, there's nothing there in some sense Cordellucci doesn't, as far as I know, get better service when he goes to the hospital, for instance. He doesn't have a VIP card because the government would nail, nail them if they did that. 
Um, so all it is is he gets his name associated with something. Yeah. So I think NFTs could do that job too. Yeah, it's a badge. It's a badge that you can carry around. And in this case, it's a badge that you're putting on something else. So you're, you're absolutely right. I didn't think of that as a use case, but absolutely. That's in fact a good one. So like the Toronto Public Library could start issuing gold cards. It, basically like a name, right? Like they can have like a seven, uh, instead of calling it a Monday, uh, schedule they will start calling it rogers rogers day schedule and then and then instead of monday they start using it and because rogers are paying them like shit ton of money and now that is done as an nft maybe again like speculative but like it's In worth exploring for sure like uh i'm pretty sure that there is there is some gaming mechanics that can be done uh uh on the on on chain that will allow this kind of use cases to flourish even more yeah that may be valuable to some people. I still call it Skydo. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. I don't understand what people talk about if they call it Rogers or whatever. <laughs> Skydo. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Naming rights got to be a big thing in my lifetime. It started out being very rare. But, yeah. for example, the first thing I remember that was sort of a naming right was what was called the O'Keefe Center which yes. was built in the 1960s with a lot of money from O'Keefe Brewers. And and now it, it changed its name to Hummingbird, I think, and then it's got some other name now. So these don't things seem to be permanent, but um, it seemed odd at the time. And now the university buildings are all named after people who donated money. In When I went to university, they were named after you know, really honorable people or people we thought were honorable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm well, thinking of Ryerson Hall. here. The Masseys paid the entire cost of building Massey Hall, did they not? Yes, you're right. That's a good example. Of but I think with O'Keefe, I don't think, that, I don't, I doubt very much O'Keefe paid for the whole thing. It was before my time of sentience, so I didn't know the financial deal. No, I think you're right. I think O'Keefe actually contributed to the building itself, to the to the building creation, and not just paying a fee for rights. Oh, uh, same yeah, like, absolutely. Same like Dow Planetarium in Montreal, which I think was actually a similar company. But could, could, did they pay the whole thing or just part of it? Well, even part of it is more than anyone's paying now for naming rights. You just so, slap your name on it. Uh, so I know, and I, I'm trying to bring the conversation back to NFT, but this is probably a good segue. Like what you just said here, as in like they paid partially. So partial ownership is also something you can put into NFTs itself. So right now, if you own Mona Lisa, you own the entire Mona Lisa, unless you buy it under corporation and then corporation is owned by 10,000 people. Sure. Uh, in this NFT space, you can buy it in a, you can create your NFT in a way where you need to have 10,000 people. Otherwise this NFT burns and burns as in like gets destroyed. And those kind of fun use cases can happen. And maybe, and I'm just making this up as a use case, as just as, as you're speaking, but you can theoretically have uh, uh, like as many people as support in a creation of NFT, that's the amount of pixels you will have the, on those NFTs. You can have those kind of weird combinations uh, as part of programmability of the entire, entire solution. So all on like fraction ownership, uh, uh, programmability, of the ownership where somebody contributing more changes the effect of the NFT itself. Those use cases and naming rights with that as well can be can be an interesting uh, use case where the person who bids the highest uh, gets to gets to buy the NFT, but the person who gets the person whose second highest bid is they don't get it, but they name it, and you can have those programmatically written down as a rule as part of the NFT. Will this help? I don't know, but this requires more brainstorming and coming with better, like, better use cases around that. Uh, I think you're in mute, even. Evan. Sorry, I was saying it's going to be interesting to see what city in the world is the first to have its major sports stadium named the Crypto Kitty Center or something like that. I was just thinking Bitcoin Center, right? Like the, the Bitcoin Center. That would, oh, be, that sorry. would be crazy. Crypto Kitty is much more fun. Evan. <laughs> 
you know what I'm really excited about, and I'm not gonna lie. Like, wh what I'm really excited about is uh, when, like, like when a major uh, sports, uh, whether it's M NBA or whether it's uh, uh, Major League Baseball or even IPL, which is cricket, uh, when a major uh, major sports or major group will create a mascot and then mascot instead of hiring an artist they would just buy a crypto kitty that is extremely popular and that becomes their mascot for everything else those are the use cases will be those are those will be fun use cases in my opinion and i'm not i don't think we are far from that that we will most likely see in next 12 months even earlier so it seems like a lot of this stuff is you say you can write a contract mm -hmm. but we found in the in the computer software field, you can write any kind of license you want, but people have decided they want a very small number of licenses because it's a lot of work to understand and debug licenses. Oh, absolutely. So I take it that that what the contracts you've talked about are kind of like smart contract libraries that people use. Yeah, absolutely. Where, where they've already they're, they're well known in some sense. Yeah. So each introduce a new one with each each transaction. Let's say. So you're you're absolutely right. And uh, uh, if you want to learn more about that, as I said, right, like ERC seven twenty one is a standard that anyone can implement, and there are libraries that implement it. And the most famous library out there is called Open Zeppelin. Uh, I'll post it here just for the knowledge. Uh, they have libraries that allows people to do ERC20 and 721, 1139 or something like that. I forgot the last one. But a bunch of tokens from scratch with a little bit of functionality, like mix and match functionality from, from different different aspects. So there are a number of solutions. Open Zeppelin is prominent for Ethereum. So, so um there's an idea that code is law now. Um, that was something yeah. Lessig introduced to me anyway, 20 years ago. And so it, if you have the same ideas embodied twice, like one in a standard, which presumably is English, but might not be, and a separate okay. one as a smart contract code in whatever the Ethereum coding language is, isn't that a mistake? Don't you really want one of them to be the the canonical one and other ones be a gloss on it, so to speak? Yes. Sure, I'm, I'm not going to argue, but we have provincial laws and federal laws. Well, so. That's what I said long ago. You have to have some bridge between laws and yeah. smart contracts, but a standard isn't such a bridge. So, so standard is... It's it's not standard is basically like and it's it's a guideline. It's not a principle, right? And the principle is what you write based on the standard, or if you deviate from it. So when you're about to, uh, so just like like law is one, and then from the law we create our own contract saying we are referring to this employ uh, employment act blah blah blah. We are referring to this corporation act blah blah blah, and that we are creating a contract. We're picking and choosing. Uh, uh, different sections of the law into our contract, and we're basing our contract based on that. The same way, standards are basically, I would, I would say, like a guidelines, like a loosely uh, suggested law, and contracts are saying, I want to take this, that feature, that feature, and that feature, and then I'm going to add ten thousand more on my stuff, and then I have a new contract. So that's how it will be done. But as 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 some use cases become prominent, uh, some of those standards become the law because of the the adoption cycle because there will be more support for those adoptions so for example erc 2020 is is the standard for fungible tokens on ethereum and it's indisputable what people will use right now if they want to create a fungible token and to the fact that ethereum itself is not compatible to erc20 people create an erc20 compatible version of it on ethereum and then that's what everyone is using all the DeFi solutions and everything. So what I'm trying to say is uh, with adoption, uh, this is this is more like a very natural selection into what will work and what will want, what won't work. And whatever is getting the most adoption moves forward. Uh, whatever doesn't get adopted, 
either they they come back in the future saying NFTs where they came back after four years with like a solid prominent use cases and uh, or they will die down or they will repurpose to something else. But the, the key is there will be a lot of duplication. We have 5,000 languages in programming to create a simple STP server and we don't have a problem with that. And that's okay. That's That's the beauty of the innovation. Oh, I actually disagree. It isn't a beauty to have so many languages. If we only had the right language, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> oh my God, we can discuss about that for this but, for hours. I really am, am headed to uh, the point, which is I've had way too much dealing with lawyers. They're very expensive. Just man, like everybody I'm, complains about programmers, lawyers are the same. Oh, they're the worst. I agree. They're, I don't want to name them, of course. <laughs> they're very expensive. And they're all artisanal, right? It's yep. terrible. What you need is something scalable, and the lawyers are not it. <laughs> so if you can, if smart contracts can replace lawyers for even ten percent of things, <laughs> it would be great. And my suggest, my, my thinking is for financial matters, where you can clearly define black or white it will it will but the fun part is you don't really need lawyers when things are black or white you need lawyers when things are not black or white <laughs> you need like like you the, the, you need lawyers for the gray things right well it's it's not always gray things it's unknown future events right fair you got to handle all the contingencies including laws that change underneath you yeah absolutely and yeah it's it's pretty it's a terrible problem and by the way programming languages are not better than law at I least agree. at least law is mostly declarative yeah there is no segmentation fault in, in in legal i get it oh they do that they certainly <laughs> have segmentation fault <laughs> Not in law, but in lawyers, yes. You're talking about fall. Forget about segmentation. I get it. <laughs> oh, my God. They are not even here to defend themselves. Come on. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, anyways, I, I, I hope this, this answer, like, like, like code as contract applies to only certain use cases right now. Uh, whenever you see uh, a middleman, uh, middlemen are middlemen are created for the purpose of solving trust problems when two parties don't trust each other, and that is worth looking from the blockchain lens. I'm not saying that blockchain will solve the problem, but that is worth looking from the blockchain lens for sure. And that's where that's where all the gems are going to come from. And if you are wondering in terms of how do we how do we trigger an on-chain transaction based on off-chain events? So my weather is terrible and like settle between Warren and me. Uh, how do how does blockchain know what the weather is? Well, there is something called oracles uh, that you might want to check out. Uh, oracles are, uh, are 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 decent or decentralized oracles are are a way to represent off chain events on chain, and you can have triggers based on that. So so that's where that's where. This is this is a nascent technology. Again, it's like it's been out there for ten years. Uh, still, it's, it's too early. Ethereum has started picking up. Only like it, Ethereum was in twenty came out in 2015, 2016. It's a five year old technology, and it started really picking up in the last three four years. So, considering that, there is going to be a lot more things happening in next few years slash decades. Uh, yeah, I just that let. let Let's put on the seat belt and just ride with it. <laughs> I have another off topic question, which sure. is we talked about the energy consumption. And that's because the foundation of this is proof of work, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any other foundations that are coming up that are plausible? Not coming up. They're there already. Like something called proof of stake is fractionally energy uh, uh, hogging, I would say, or like they use this, like fractional energy uh, reserves. Uh, there is 
if you want, you can use proof of authority, but I wouldn't suggest it in, in all public blockchains. But uh, I think, like, and again, this is my point of view and you can call it a bias point of view and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind it. And I would not even argue and defend it is, it's not that much of energy consumption compared to what it's solving as a problem. Uh, there are some videos that I can pass it on to you to, to, to like do some fact check and everything. Uh, people have done fact checks. This is more of like uh, someone said it's using this much energy. Sure, it does. I'm not lying. That. Like it, I'm not saying that it won't. But there is more energy that is it can save if everyone migrates to that particular technology. Like think about how much energy people, offices, all those things for transportation, for for the regular currency, fiat currency, moving around, paper printing that goes on when you have like like legal love pr printing paper. And uh, uh, it's like their side hobby. So what I'm saying is with, with, with a contract, those printing and everything can be literally avoided. That can be super greener alternative. It's just that it's, it, it is becoming up to a point that if you argue that uh, blockchain is not, uh, uh, blockchain is energy, energy saving solution, then it's not a popular solution. And then you have to fight 10,000 people. Then people say, yeah, sure. Proof of stake will solve it. If you are not giving numbers, I'm not giving numbers. That's what people start doing this these days. But there are there are there are fact based research that suggests that uh, it's not the case at all. Uh, so so this I'll, I'll give you a video. Like again, this is this is all speculative because we are not going to go and count each and every miner out there in the world. But I'll send you a video that uh, that I particularly like uh, that that goes into like fair explanation of this okay great as i said i'm not up on all this um there's a seems to be something scary going on in the bitcoin world which is the majority of miners are in china and the government has made rumblings of shutting down mining in china is one never knows how these things sort out but mm -hmm. do you have any insight into what's going on there not inside, but philosophy for sure. Like it's, it's like it's like uh, uh, it's like that the hydra. If you cut one head, it will grow up. This is the blockchain, right? That's the beauty of blockchain. No one organization, country, religion, or group can exclude it in a way. Like it's impossible to do it. That's the beauty of blockchain. Uh, if there is enough people believing in it, even if it's like ten people, it will survive. And if China doesn't, and there are, there, are, there are two things that people have been looking from the the China banning on crypto mining these days. Uh, one is the hash power, the, the mining equipments are migrating to, or distributing to uh, Europe and especially in North America quite a bit actually, because there's lots of people like, okay, North America is, has not done crypto mining ban yet. So let's just go and start mining that it will be profitable again. So it's this ban is decentralizing the uh, the distribution of uh, where the miners are geographically. So that's one theory. And the second theory is even if China goes and cuts each and every miner right now, why, what is stopping another miner to pop up in another corner and do it secretly? Nothing. All they have to do is prove, prove the energy consumption is done by some heat generating events. And then, boom, that's like you can run secret mining machines and even not secret, like even if you do it openly. But Bitcoin mining, until it's profitable, and which it is, like at least uh, two, you get your return on investment on Bitcoin mining infrastructure right now in roughly 12 months, and everything else after that is profitable uh, and probably 10x return on whatever you're doing at the current rate. It's gonna grow. It's gonna grow as long as you provide people financial reward. People will people will do it. So the trick is to make it unprofitable and give governments enough incentive to do that, and that can happen too. Absolutely. The the trick is to make make it less. Uh, uh, so so the trick here is to make it less. Uh, 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 basically, financially rewarding for miners to run it. Now, how would they can do it? Well, they can. They can increase the capital gains tax. They can ban Bitcoin trading. Well, if they do it, then other countries will pick it up. 
they can uh, 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 they can they can reduce the price of Bitcoin to the core, like they let's say sales tax. See again, they could add sales tax. Right, they can add like crypto tax. Right, they can add all kinds of tax. But the moment the moment a, a government adds tax on something, it means it's legal. So it's the price going to shut up? <laughs> right, like think about it. Like if 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 government starts uh, uh, taxing. Uh, the usage of marijuana means they are saying marijuana is legal as long as you pay me for that. Uh, so, so that is a victory. So this is this is in a way this is a victory. So, I, in my opinion, I have not come across a way to completely cut off uh, Bitcoin or any other uh, crypto that is that is e equally adopted. To completely wipe off uh, from the art. There is no way to do it. Only one crypto can, can theoretically kill another crypto by by simply having more usage than the other one. That's the only thing I can think of that can kill. Like the only thing that can kill Bitcoin is another Bitcoin. Well, in my I theory, think China could kill it by by expropriating all the equipment in its country and being a single owner of more than half of the bitcoin generation capability so so what would be there so first of all if that happens then the world can literally say okay let's find out where the geographic location is this china let's create a fork of bitcoin which is not run by chinese machines and that becomes the original bitcoin let's not even use this bitcoin at all and then you have a bitcoin that is like uh, that then it just creates a new version that and everyone Everyone might get to that one. Simple as that. Oh, there's a there's all sorts of other things, you know, uh, placing an extra tax on on uh, that. Now, this is something that the G7 and China have to agree on, so it's hard to evade. Mm -hmm. But exactly. but but doing things as simple as you know an extra tax mm -hmm. on super high powered graphics cards. You know, there's all sorts of little nibbling at the edges that I think could some total make it unprofitable. Uh, so Indeed, making it unprofitable, that. making it unprofitable will be extremely tough, uh, pretty much impossible, because if it becomes unprofitable, here's what will happen. And it has happened uh, a few times in the history. 27, sorry, 2018, uh, Bitcoin dropped to around twenty five hundred three thousand dollars And it the, at that rate, for, for an efficient miner, running a Bitcoin mining operation was, uh, uh, was roughly, to generate one Bitcoin, they had to spend roughly four thousand dollars, so it was a little bit. It was at that time unprofitable for miners to mine Bitcoin. What happened? Well, inefficient miners started shutting down their 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 operation, uh, and because they shut down their operation, the entire Bitcoin hash rate came down. Entire hash rate came down means now the power required for other miners to generate one Bitcoin lowered and the amount it required to generate a bitcoin uh lowered so the now the price to generate one bitcoin became like three thousand instead of four thousand dollars for efficient miners and the price bounced back for three thousand dollars and suddenly it found an equilibrium so that that's the that's the elasticity of the entire ecosystem and that's what that's the beauty of it actually how how it all finds an equilibrium in in a very sustainable way Can you comment on um, the different, getting back to NFTs. Yes. <laughs> um, Fair. Can you comment on the different platforms um, like Flow and I think there's a side chain on Bitcoin, um, Liquid. And uh, tell me if I'm missing something important. Um, because it always seemed like Ethereum, it's, it's wonderful in some ways, um, but it's this general purpose thing. And as soon as you have a specific purpose, you could probably optimize something differently, right? Um, so could you comment on- Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so you're bringing a very interesting topic that is, that is quite close to uh, my philosophy uh, for the long-term use case of blockchain. So one philosophy is purpose-built blockchains, where each and every blockchain will serve one purpose and one purpose extremely well compared to other, other, compared to other blockchains. And this philosophy is coined by Gavin, Dr. Gavin Woods, who was the, the co-founder of Ethereum, and uh, then he co-founded Polkadot. 
uh, currently at Polkadot, uh, of course, leading leading the charge for the next steps. And that's why he created the parachain ecosystem and everything. Now, what you're saying is what other NFT specific blockchains are out there? Well, Ethereum is the king, no doubt about that. Ethereum invented NFTs. The gas prices, as you said, is huge and it's not, it's sometimes unprofitable to do any transaction on Ethereum, at least the low volume, low, low, low price transaction. So that's one part of it. The second uh, uh, best is using some L2s. Now, L2s are there are ways with ZK rollups and optimistic rollup to mint NFTs, but that's an experimental technology. I'm not talking about experimental use case, something experimental technology, and it hasn't been proven end to end or at the scale yet. So I'll, I'll, I'll shelve it for now. Another one that you can use is something called Matic. Matic is a, a scalable shard solution on top of Ethereum. Of course, I'm generalizing it, not going into much detail, but Matic is, you can think it of as a side chain of Ethereum. Uh, and so Matic is another solution. Uh, there is Flow, Flow blockchain. Flow blockchain is the same team that was, that created CryptoKitties. And uh, Dapper Labs, uh, Dapper Labs is the company behind CryptoKitties and Flow Blockchain. They recently raised the round at around six billion dollars. So they are here to say uh, the one major number that 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 increases my belief in Flow Blockchain uh, in the recent recent weeks is they claim that they have roughly one million users on their blockchain. One million wallets have been issued on the Flow Blockchain, and haven't validated the information. This is a secondhand information. So take it sparingly, of course. But that if that number is true, then I believe that that's a, that's a very strong signal for Flow Blockchain. Uh, another one is uh, Engine, E-N-J-N, Engine. This blockchain is created for the sole purpose of uh, gaming NFT. Huge adoption is coming into that. Huge believer into it. Of course, I don't own, own any coin or anything, so don't worry. I'm not trying to shill the coins here. Uh, all, all I'm saying is they they are they are creating purpose-built blockchain for the specific purpose of gaming assets, where where virtual games and assets are being traded. So engine blockchain is good. E A E N G I N. Uh, Polkadot, Cardano, name a blockchain, Solana. Uh, all of them has NFT solutions. All of them. Not gonna even pick one or the other one because they all have uh, equally good and equally bad solutions. <laughs> so no favorites there. Uh, another one that I personally am feeling good about it, but I haven't seen any results yet, is the name is Palm. P A L M. Palm blockchain. Uh, Palm blockchain is, uh, in a nutshell, it's an Ethereum fork, but created by consensus uh, blockchain. So consensus, consensus people who don't know. It's like IBM of uh, uh, of the blockchain world. Uh, uh, they do most of the enterprise projects. They have venture creation arm. They have done a ton of support in the blockchain ecosystem, especially and not especially mainly to the Ethereum. So so Palm is created by consensus, and their uh, uh, their tagline is a greener alternative for. Ethereum. So they are they are using proof of stake and they are using light version of proof of stake in order to do it. They are particularly using Hyperledger Basu, uh, which is uh, uh, which is which is in a way uh, in in a way Ethereum code deployed for enterprise uh, enterprise adoption, uh, but in this case used for general purpose. So I have some doubts about it, but the intentions are right and with the right brands, they can definitely be a major major plus. In addition, they have like MetaMask plugin as well. So this is the landscape of how I see NFTs right now. Uh, I, I know I gave up like roughly seven or eight different potential solutions, but they all have a uh, reason to exist, but we don't know which one will really exist after 12 months. Which ones do you think have um, the best potential in terms of scaling, in terms of uh, doing a large number of transactions? Flow, Ethereum, and... Uh, uh, if Palm works out great, then yes. Like I have, I have, I have my 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 heart says it will work, my mind says it won't. <laughs> so those three, in my opinion, will have the highest amount of traction. Engine will have the specific the traction on the on the gaming side. But honestly speaking, like it's very unpredictable. Like I, I I'm saying these names, 
And if you ask me after one week, the entire numbers, uh, entire naming will be different because there's so many things happening in this. Like I, 90% of the facts, uh, in fact, facts are changing. And everything is a secondhand fact that I have not read and seen their code themselves. So I'm literally saying based on what I've heard and based on what I've heard, I'm creating a prioritization in my head. So please take this information very sparingly. Like this is an opinion and opinion only, okay? Yeah. Do you think all the NFT transactions that we've heard about are real or do you think there was a certain amount of self-dealing to create a market? I'm, I'm sure there's self-dealing as well. Like I, I don't know which one's which actually speaking, but like here, here is my thing, right? Like I'm not, uh, if I put my tinfoil hat, then yes, I'm pretty sure there is some dealing going on. My, I'm, I'm trying to keep, stay true to my heart, which is like, let me focus on the technology and its real use cases. And let's assume that everyone is trying to do the right thing and right thing only. So let's assume that way. So I don't focus on the numbers. I focus on the facts and facts being uh, what are what what technology can really do and the claim that they are making that this technology can do that, can it really do that? So that's what I'm really focused on. Whether, whether, whether that art was really sold for 69 million or not, uh, my confidence level on that 69 million one is high, but there can be other ones that may not be that high, uh, but I generally don't focus on it. And sorry, I don't, I don't know if I answer your questions or not. I don't think you can. I, I, I don't blame you for, I'm glad you tried. I'm thinking about the stock market is full of oh, yeah. pathology. Made of order book. Yeah. And, uh, there's a whole industry set to catch that sort of stuff and they're mostly successful. Yes, I agree. And somebody did a really interesting uh, statistical analysis of different, um, I think it was like um, um, Bitcoin exchanges or, or just, a, and some of the exchanges had more uh, dubious transactions than others. And they kind of found a statistical way to kind of, uh, figure it out. And basically, the more legit exchanges didn't really have that much fake volume. And uh, the ones that looked dubious at the beginning, sure enough, uh, there's a pretty good amount of uh, dubious volume on them. Um, I'll, and just, so that I'll just add like one word to it. To Google it. Search Coin Square. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. No, like, Still, I'm a fan of that company to a point because that's the one I would root for in Canadian. Honestly, I'm rooting for Bitbuy now because I know the founders and they mean really well. But again, I don't know what the internal dealings everyone is having these days anyway. So uh, I, I, I try to focus on, uh, I take the information as literally considering that everyone is saying the truth and truth only, and I'm not going to validate with the truth or not because there's no real way to find out. Let's just focus on what this technology can really do and let's push the boundaries and the use cases. Like that's the ethos that I'm going with. Otherwise I would go mad. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyone would. Um, okay, I have to get like running. Is there any last question that I can answer? Sorry. Sorry, I was just gonna say things are slowing down. So, uh, and we are coming to 20 after nine. So I think uh, we'll start to wrap it up. That's okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chin Mei, for your presentation and this great discussion. Uh, it uh, definitely had a, a lot of uh, interest, obviously, and uh, a lot of questions. So uh, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, it's a lot of information to take in for sure. <laughs> no problem. This is, this is a fun conversation. And this is like this kind of conversations keeps me true to what the real use case is and not going to like a crazy land of like, like hopium, right? So. This is, thank you for asking like tough questions. Appreciate it. Well, thanks very much. And yeah. thanks everybody for coming and uh, have a great night. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.